So here are some of the answers that people have asked me about my regression. After people have purchased my regression on my website, they start getting into that, hearing me go through that entire process. I, they come back with a lot of questions. And I thought that this would be a perfect opportunity for me, drinking my coffee in the morning, to come in and answer some of those questions because I, I get lots of questions about it. Uh, I got another, one recently where they he just had three questions, but I'd like to talk about that that experience of that that first regression. And I say first regression because a certain percentage of people who get regressed continue to have regressive moments, and I'm one of those. So sometimes somebody will say something, it will trigger a memory of that past life, and I'll and I'll have that memory. So I consider it uh, an ongoing regression, really. My first regression was with the hypnotherapist in, in Virginia, and um, it was an amazing experience. So let's just talk about some of the questions that I normally get. First question, what did I look like? It's a great question, but my memories are from my perspective. So I'm looking through my eyes, not, not at my body. So I have no memory of what my face looked like. Um, I have a memory of looking down at my body, and it was, um, it was a sinewy, very low-fat body. Uh, and I know that because I was wearing what was known as a Fisher's coat, which I, was something I researched after the regression. Um, basically, it's a Galilean one-piece bathing suit because you can't go out in the water in all your robes, or you'll, if you fell in, you'd drown. So... This was sort of a, a sleeveless tunic that tied at the waist, and it only was in mid-thigh. So that was really um, what I could see of that. So I don't really have a, a full understanding of, of what I look like at the time. Second question. Were you speaking Aramaic? I get that one so often. Where was I speaking Aramaic? So in the regression, I had this moment when I first got into that, regression. I was in that beach. First of all, let me just say, it's a, for me, my regression was a completely visceral experience. And when I say that, what I mean that I was physically on that beach. I was feeling the, the wind. I was smelling the air. I was feeling the stones beneath my feet. I could hear the sounds. I was physically there in the regression. And the conversation with the regressionist were the thoughts in my head. So it was, it was as if the consciousness swapped place. So it was like I was physically there having this experience. The first person I saw in the regression was actually John of Old's father, Zebedee. And I, I turned, and he was standing there, and he, he, was, uh, he was actually leaning against a, a walking stick or a staff. And I, it, I literally say in the regression, it's because his back is in bed. He's, he's done too much of the work, so now I do it. He started to speak. As he started to speak, I couldn't understand him. And I couldn't understand him because he was speaking a different language. And as he was speaking in that language, I, I literally said to the regressionist, I don't understand. I, I, I don't understand what he's saying. And regressionists are great because they have specific tools to help you transition the mind. And one of the things she said, she says, imagine if you put a, a megaphone to your ear. And whatever he was saying was coming into that megaphone and it was coming into your ear and you could understand it. And suddenly, he, this happened. Um, I imagined that, and suddenly, I, bam, I could understand what he was talking about. And the issue was, we had had, there was something about transportation, transporting fish, moving them from here up to where we had to sell them. And whatever method we used to transport them was broken or was not working. And we were trying to figure out a way to get all the fish up to the marketplace to sell. Um, and it was, it was, uh, just a mundane business conversation. So another question I get frequently is, was that my spiritual awakening? The regression was a big stepping stone on a, on a spiritual path that I'm walking now. But, um, when I was a kid, I had imaginary friends that I'd talked to and I'd have uh, out-of-body experiences that my brothers and sisters later told me about that I don't even remember. Uh, I, Mom came out of the back door one day, and, and my G.I. Joe was up on a crucifix in the backyard. 
I've been having, have been having experiences my entire life. And it was one of the reasons, it was actually one of the reasons that, that caused the rift between me and my father. I don't think he could understand me because I was so different. I was very odd, <laughs> right? Um, so was it part of my spiritual awakening? Yes. Was it, was it a, a big part of my spiritual awakening? My, my, my spiritual awakening rolled out slowly. When I was 19, I had an, an epiphany moment, and I really I felt the presence of Jeshua at 19. But my regression wasn't until I was 30. So, you know, it was very much an ongoing rolling process. My first Kundalini rising was, was um, prior to my regression, prior to me, even the first psychic telling me about it. So I was having these experiences, and it was building up to this moment. But in that moment, in that regression, after 19 psychics told me, and I doubted all, that, all of them, that regression moment was definitely a pivotal point for me consciously stepping into spirituality. Uh, and I think it's, I think it's, uh, I think we're all connected to the oneness of God, and I think we all have, have awakenings that we don't necessarily remember, and we have things that are going on, and we're transitioning through, and we're, you know, we're, we're experiencing things. And I think that, um, for me personally, it was an ongoing, lifelong awakening. And I think it, hopefully, you know, it'll continue to be awakening even more. So uh, right now I feel very happy about where I am and things are really pretty beautiful in my life. So uh, that's, that's uh, the greatest thing. The other thing I want to talk about before I go on to the next part is um, spiritual awakening. People look for the light show. People look for that, that aha moment. People look for that, that thing Spiritual awakening is is living in the present. All transcendental experience is present moment. And so when you sit sit in your present moment and you want to have an aha moment or a light show experience, a spiritual light show experience, realize you're not going to get it because you have to be present in the belief that it's happening now. It has to be coming into your experience in the present moment. You don't get to the future ever in your life. You don't get, and, and the past has been left behind, right? There's nothing you can do back there, and there's nothing you're going to do in the future. My friend Holly used to say, you can't go to the store next Thursday right now. Really, it's about being here in presence. So spiritual awakening, and this question about was the regression uh, when I had my spiritual awakening. My spiritual awakening has been ongoing since I was born. And I think everyone's is. It's just a matter of where are you in the path. And you have some moments that might be bigger than others. But remember, you're, you're always, you're always in coming through this awareness of your oneness with God. And actually, you, you come into the world completely aware. And as beliefs are given to you, you lose that awareness. And what does the Bible say? It says, you must become as a child to enter the kingdom of heaven, which means become aware again and strip away all those beliefs that mean nothing to the oneness of God. Next question, what is the awakening that's happening in Egypt? I get this question frequently uh, because the regression does talk about Egypt. And what was, what was really interesting was uh, when all these psychics had told me and, and it had become very, people were really, at that time in my life, people were really interested in me. Uh, because you know, famous psychics were tell, were saying things. P- famous in the, in regards that very well known psychics were, were telling me that I was John. Um, people who were um, certified psychics through the Association for Research and Enlightenment, the Edgar Casey Foundation, told me. Um, people who read for uh, Nick Bunick in his book The Messengers, too, where he found out about being the Apostle Ball, had read for me. There's a lot of very big interest in me and what I was doing because. There's also a book called The Prophetic Revelations of Paul Solomon, and it talks about the reincarnation of John doing all kinds of things. And prior to the regression, I had been asked to go to Egypt. Um, and, and I was like, yeah, and they kept saying, there's, there's things that Paul Solomon's uh, channeling say that the, the Apostle John is supposed to do. In the initial meeting with the regressionist, I told her, I said, all these people are telling me I'm supposed to go to Egypt because of, you know, what, what's, what's going on. I want to make sure, you know, if, if, if that comes up, great. So she, she's waiting for this moment to ask that question. She actually asked that question for me because I asked her to. As we go through the regression, 
we go through this whole life. She, I witness the crucifixion. I do all that. And then she starts just asking questions. And she says, does this mean go to Egypt? And that's all she said. Does this mean go to Egypt? And I started talking about Egypt in a way that I had never thought of or heard of or anything. If you go on my, if you go on my YouTube channel and you use the search function and you, and you look up the title, The Story I Wasn't Going to Tell, that tells the story of what happened to me when I did finally go to Egypt. Um, and there was, it does talk about energetic stuff that happened and all that stuff, but for me, that trip was a very interesting trip because for me that was, um, I went there completely blind. I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea why I was there. And I liked it that way. <laughs> uh, and when things did happen, they were more real to me because I wasn't being told what would happen at all. I, I So I had a very big experience. And I'm going to let you go to that video to, to uh, check that out. So... Um, so the awakening in Egypt was really about, a, I don't know whether it was an energetic awakening for something bigger or something within me, but it was, there was definitely something big that did happen in Egypt. And, um, and I think that it, it was a big one because what happened was after the events of that story, which is in that video, we actually got contacted by multiple psychics worldwide who said they felt a shift in the world. And um, in the Paul Solomon writings, he says, um, John the Beloved will bless the place of the mysteries with the one that he loved. And so I, you know, I, I, I question it myself. What, is, what was that meaning? What does that mean? And I just think that maybe I, I am, because I know what Jeshua felt like, maybe I brought the essence of Jeshua or the pure love that he had that he expressed to that space, and maybe that's what, what happened. So that's my, uh, my thought on that. L another question I got was, the masculine energy of Peter I mentioned, the mind, ego, and John's feminine energy, the soul, heart. The, he, the, whoever asked this question is asking, he added mind, ego, and, and, and John's en energy, soul, heart, right? I think it's far simpler. I think mind, ego... I think the reason why I'm questioning the way it's being asked because ego just means self-awareness. People people um, look at it from the perspective, many different perspectives, and he's probably coming at it from that perspective too. Um, but the idea of mind ego, uh, I think it's a, it's a matter of getting in our heads and out of our hearts. And I think the the masculine way of doing things is to figure out how, and the feminine way of doing it is to figure is to feel it, and. When I look at um, this entire structure of what I'm discussing right now, I don't believe there's gender involved. I believe masculine and feminine is 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 a is you know an imperfect terminology for this experience. It's in the head or in the heart. It's it's in the thinking mind, like he's saying. Or it's in the feeling, right? And which is his other word was soul heart. Well, the reason I question the way it's being asked is because soul and heart are two different things. Um, soul to me is, is the same thing as the Holy Spirit. Uh, you, your soul is who you are without your fears, your anxieties, and that is also the Holy Spirit. It's just the same terminology. And heart to me is the heart center, right? It is the place of feeling. But, uh, but to, to, it's, it's, it's hard to describe because it's, it's, we, we tend as humans to, to describe things in very physical form. The heart, the head, right? And I don't think, that's, I don't think it's physical like that. I think, I think it's feeling and thinking. And I think that the, to, to use the imperfect words it, it doesn't clearly demonstrate what I'm talking about. Are you thinking it too much or are you feeling it? And when we get in our heads and we think, we, we, we lose the feeling because we're too busy thinking. You know, in, the, in the Bible, the Adam and Eve, they ate from the tree of knowledge. They got kicked out of paradise. Well, if you think about what paradise is, it's a, it's a subjective feeling. 
Some people think paradise is the is a beach, and some people think it's the mountains. You know, so it, it's it's not the experience in the physical world; it's the feeling. It feels like a a perfection. It feels like paradise, right? And in the head, we lose those feelings because we're too busy thinking. We're too busy in the the contemplative, and and so it's it's not a physical you know head and heart. It's 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 literally just the sojourns of the mind and the feeling of the physical of the the feeling of love really and when you look at it from that perspective it comes very interesting now the the way this question was asked can you briefly discuss these in regard of how the feminine is expanding into the world now i'm going to remove the word feminine cuz i really think we should stop delineating between man and woman just because the, the sheer delineation creates the possibility for um, hierarchy. I just think that we're, we're all equal and we're all humans and we're all having some people are male, some people are female, some people are masculine, some people are feminine. I, I know an amazingly masculine woman who is incredible and I, I've known very feminine men who are incredible. And so... The, there's a blurry line between masculine and feminine, and I think the, the using the delineations of it itself can be detrimental to us because people can use those as the lines that they stand behind. And we should have no lines. I would love to go back in history and talk to the guy who first said, this is my border. I'd love to go back and, and have a conversation with him saying, look, you're creating the thing you're going to fight over. Right, and I would love to go back and, and, and talk to that person and, and show him that, or her exactly how they're they're creating delineations that are going to become detrimental, and that the, and all those delineations, all of them, come from the mind, not from the heart, not from the feeling place, right? And the in my regression, I talked about the masculine and feminine. Here's why. Uh, I had been having a spiritual awakening. I had read a lot of books. And in that regression, I was, especially towards the end, I was grasping for words to explain things in a way that I could comprehend. And I had read things about masculine and feminine. And I, I was, uh, I knew a man who was an author who was talking a lot about masculine and feminine. And so in that regression... My responses were not divine. They were, they were coming through the filter of me. And so by using the term masculine and feminine, I was actually speaking from what I knew in the physical world. From, so these, these delineations, these, these this is this and this is this, and I have to understand what this means, that's you in your head. Let go of all that. The communication with God is in the feelings. And... My expression of the feminine was the feelings, not, not a gender in any way, shape, or form, or any of that sort of situation. But the question is, can you briefly discuss these in regard to how the feminine is expanding into the world? We are at a time right now where people are, are really opening to the capacity of love. And people are going to say, what are you talking about? It's crazy. Things are screaming. Yeah. The people who are screaming are the minority. And they're screaming because they're losing control and they're losing their fear because they're in their head. You know, I mean, they're getting fearful because they're in their head. And being fearful, the first thing they do is, is they yell and holler and scream. And when they yell, holler, and scream, they don't have substance. They're just fighting against. They, they are on the other side of their line and they're fighting and they're arguing. But they run out of things to say very quickly because they can't really justify what they're believing. They can't really justify racism. They really can't justify sexism. They really can't justify um, the, the hatred for one or the other. It's just the, the border, the line that they've chosen to stand behind. It's just the thing that they're gonna fight over. And what's happening is we are becoming more and more global. And in becoming more and more global, we're seeing people all over the world who just do not want to have that kind of world. You know, when, when Russia invaded Ukraine, 
Ukrainian mothers were helping Russian soldiers connect with their mothers back in Russia. It, it, beautiful, right? In Maui, there, there was a, a news article, right? A, a, a news thing. They were, they were saying the, the police are really having a problem down there at the fire site because uh, all these people have gone out, to, you know, saw that there was a problem, went out to the stores and started buying food and water and, and, and clothing and, and you know, camping equipment and, and all kinds of things, and they're taking it down to the site to help people, and there's just too many people helping people. And the police were overwhelmed by the, you know, not being able to get things in and out of the, the circumstance into the, into the area because there's too many people trying to help. I mean, it's not really a problem that they're trying to help, really. Let them go in. Stop trying to funnel them. You know, let them go in and help people. Get rid of the border. Get rid of the line. You know, go in and help people, right? And the fact that the news and everything is, is making it a bad thing that people are going out to help is just because the bad things are what sell. The, the bad things are what create the ratings, right? And so it's the line. It's the line that they're fighting over. Uh, but right now, everyone's waking up to the, to the feeling of just loving one another. And you see, I see it everywhere. When I, when I left this work, you know, uh, 10, 15 years ago, I left because no one, was, no one was showing that desire to awaken to their own love within. When I came back to this work a couple of years ago, I was blown away with how different it was and how everybody was trying to come back to that space of that love within and expressing that love. And they're all, everyone's empowering themselves right now. And the people who aren't are the ones who are getting loud. But there's, there's far less of them than there are of us. And we are awakening, and the veil is getting thinner because love is on the other side of that delineation line. And we're, we're bringing that border down, that line that's been drawn between love and fear. And we're, we're bringing that line down. We're making that veil thinner. We're creating an experience where it's more loving. The question is, are you taking your part of the world and, and being the, the thinner veil for others to see? And that's really, that's really the key to that. What else do, do people want to know about my regression? Um, it was an amazing experience. I spoke with Mary in, in the regression. I was having a conversation with her. And the, the regressionist said, well, what, what's, you know, led me to what's going on. And, I, and my response was, uh, she said, because, because I took care of her then, she's taking care of me now. And so that was a, an interesting thing. Now, you're hearing me talk about these, these her as an individual within the oneness of God, right? I know full well that I'm one with her, and I'm one with Jeshua, and I'm one with my mom, and I'm one with my friend Bill who passed, and I'm one with you. And that oneness experience that I experienced when Jeshua touched my heart showed me that the entire world is me. And when I see that entire world as me, you know, I appreciate that music someone's playing because that's me. I'm feeling that, that, that energy, that feeling. See, in the physical world, someone plays that instrument. But in the oneness of God, we all feel that instrument. We all feel that experience. It's just passion of love. It's just a physical expression of how we choose to put love into the world. And so that person playing that beautiful music, you know, I, John in the physical world has not focused enough to have that skill because I've not put my energy there, right? But I can sit there in that moment and just feel the love and the joy coming from that, that instrument, from that artist, and know that that's me. Know that that's, that's, that's me. And when I look at the idea of, of a beautiful painting, you know, I, that's me. I painted that. You know, did I paint that one? No, I didn't paint that. But I, I feel the passion in those paintings, right? And it's a matter of really, really looking at your world through the perspective of feeling, which is the, <laughs> the feminine, right? It's the feeling. God speaks to us in feelings. We have to respond in feelings. So when things don't feel right, that's God saying, this isn't for you. And when something feels right, you go, yeah, this is for me. 
But when, when you have that moment where you're experiencing something that doesn't feel right, you answer God by saying, okay, I, this is not for me. I am doing this and refocusing on what does feel right and putting yourself into that space of what does feel right. Because the more you keep the feeling alive, the more the physical world surrounds you with that experience. And understanding that everything that you're talking about and everything you're seeing is an expression of you in some form. It's an expression of you in some form. You know, I often talk about this house across the street from me. Little brick rancher. It was a pretty little house until they put a giant blue roof on top of it. Now, I don't like that roof, right? But I also know that I'm, I'm finding that Ohio is not for me. And I am manifesting a move back to the beach. So things in Ohio are starting not to look so good because it's a reflection of me. That blue roof is a reflection of me. And I, and I appreciate that blue roof even though I don't like the look of it because that blue roof is a reflection of me saying, I'm, this, this is not for me. Why would that house be directly across from my house and reflect that to me every time I look out the window? Because I, I go, yeah, this is not for me. This area is not for me. You know, so I'm, I'm, I follow my feelings. I follow my heart. You know, there's a famous saying, when you do what you love, the money will come. Follow your heart. And, and the abundance of God, the, the universe, is yours. But it's a matter of coming to that space. I went off t topic on my, my regression. Because these, are the, these are the lessons that I want you to get from my regression. Because my regression... It's going back to one of the earlier questions is this was it my had my spiritual awakening? It was a big one. <laughs> it was definitely a big one. Um, I the regression to me was pivotal. But what was it pivotal for? It was pivotal for how I live my life now. And it really comes down to getting very present. That was the best thing I learned from my regression. You've got to get very present, and your, your key to life is releasing your fears and your anxieties. And you don't realize how many you have until you start going down the road and realizing you saw somebody who didn't look like you, so you locked your door, right? That's a fear, right? I went to the grocery store, the actually convenience store the other day, and... I walked in and I started joking with everybody around me and I walked out the door and got in my Jeep and I never once thought about the fact that everybody I just talked to was a black person. It wasn't even in my mind, right? Because they're just people too. They're just part of me as well. And if I want to be treated well, I have to treat people well. Whatsoever you do to the least of my brothers, that you do unto me. So that was the lesson from my regression, is coming back and having that experience and understanding that element. So there are more questions, I'm sure, about the regression itself, but those are, the, those are the, some of the big ones, some of the, the big key ones. And I'm, I'm hoping that this gives you um, some understanding of what that regression was really like. And um, more importantly, how, how I live my life now because of my spiritual awakening. You guys have a great day and I'll talk to you soon. See ya. Bye.